Are we on? Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. I know, I know, the apparent irony of my being a white middle-class woman who believes feminism has been hijacked by white middle-class women will, I'm certain, not be lost on you. But it is, in many ways, a vindication of my case. After all, I'm a minority within my own community, unrepresentative of Muslim women either here or in the global south in terms of either my socioeconomic profile or ethnicity, despite the frequency with which I am called upon to speak from within that subjectivity. Before attending today, I thought long and hard about whether I should trade my place for one of my many personal heroines, women of colour whose voices are often, so often, overridden not only by a white narrative, but white privilege, which however mitigating my headscarf might be of aspects of it, I nevertheless embody. I ultimately decided to partake for one central reason, and that is to emphasize that critique of white feminism or white culture more broadly is not a discussion about race, but of a political category implying an unequal balance of power between dominant white culture and subaltern identities. The term white people doesn't refer to the color of people's skin as much as it refers to people's identification with the dominant power relations which continue to subjugate people of color to a second class status and relegates women of color specifically to the bottom of that heap. I can't and I refuse to speak for Muslim women. I speak only as a feminist Muslim woman whose solidarity lies first and foremost with the global south. And I speak as an intersectional feminist who believes race, class and gender are critical to feminist discussions. Arundhati Roy once said, there's no such thing as the voiceless, only the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. When it comes to alternative conceptions of feminism, the feminist movement has been doggedly resistant to including alternative voices. And by including, I don't mean merely recognizing that alternative voices exist on the margins, a benevolent nod to those who don't quite conform to our ways. Nor do I mean the superficial diversity of different faces. I'm talking about the substantive diversity of different conceptions of female flourishing. I mean accepting that the white liberal secular framework is not the only acceptable lens through which women can articulate their struggles. Rather than the predominant assumption that alternative feminist voices are playing catch up with Western feminism, I mean realizing that feminism isn't about saving women from the global south, it's actually about learning from them as true equals in a shared struggle. Although this recognition is slowly trickling through, it's often too tokenistic and at times deeply patronizing. My PhD research is on Morocco, where many of the women I interview identify as committed religious believers. In their society, they're at the forefront of struggling for the reinterpretation of religious texts in an egalitarian light. They combat the notion of male supremacy. But they also, in many cases, reject the term feminism as a Western construct which is ill-fitting to their needs as Moroccan Muslim women. An import, one woman described it as, and I quote, another form of cultural imperialism designed to alienate native women from the real source of their power, their own culture. While as a Muslim feminist, I am well aware of the struggles for equality within my faith, I also recognize that the problem of gender inequality cannot be laid at the feet of religion alone. In fact, poverty and authoritarianism are often more decisive. The feminism I relate to, the feminism that I draw on, is the feminism of women resisting imperialism, exploitation, war, and patriarchy. It's the feminism of Indian women fighting back against rape culture. It's Palestinian women resisting Israeli occupation. It's Bengali women demanding basic safety conditions in sweat factories producing clothes for fake fashion feministas. The innumerable women of the Arab uprisings and their ongoing resistance. When I say feminism's been hijacked by white women, I mean white culture continues to dominate the narrative in all fields and renders alternative alternative points of view, a quaint contribution permitted to confirm the eternal truth of Western supremacy. 
I mean the instrumentalization of the Malala Yousafzais of this world, local heroines turned into political pawns to justify ongoing wars and occupations, which ultimately hit women worst. Women's education recasts as a justifiable motive for Western imperialism. For all the feminist justifications for the plunder of Afghanistan, its maternal death rate today stands amongst the highest in the world. There is plenty of research on the impact of conflict on women who are among its primary victims, not only in terms of actual casualties of war, but also in their struggle for autonomy, because what conflicts actually do is polarize gender roles. Masculinity becomes more aggressive and women are idealized as the bearers of a cultural identity. Women's bodies become part of the battlefield. And this is as true of the Democratic Republic of the Congo as it is of Afghanistan. And this is where white feminism continues to fail the true test of feminist solidarity in taking on board the critiques coming from the margins. There's far too little introspection, far too much reticence to question white supremacy. White women were active participants in, proponents of and key beneficiaries of the systems of slavery in the US as well as in the colonial empires and arguably continue to be beneficiaries of imperialism and exploitation today. The cheap clothes we buy, the petrol we fill our cars with, the diamonds we covet, they are all tied into the feminist struggle because to paraphrase bell hooks, if feminism seeks to make women equal to men, then it is impossible because Western society does not view all men equally. There can be no equality between men and women until there is a redress of the global inequities which posit whiteness at the top of the human hierarchy and consequently posit white bourgeois women as the benchmark for female emancipation. And this is where groups like Femen are part of the problem, with statements such as, and I quote, as a society, we haven't been able to eradicate our Arab mentality towards women, because we all know, of course, that all Arab men hate women, right? In response to a campaign by Muslim women to actively denounce Femen as racist and patronizing, Ina, who graces us with her presence tonight, responded, and I quote, they write on their posters that they don't need liberation, but it's in their eyes. It says, help me. White savior complex, anyone? This brand of pseudo-feminism, which confirms the idea of passive, voiceless women of color who need saving from their men, if not from themselves, is not one I recognize. Do women in the global south struggle with issues of patriarchy? Uh, yeah, alongside all the other problems fostered by an unequal capitalist system, they also struggle with local variations on the virtually universal problem of patriarchy. Those who seek to proclaim a hyperarching female solidarity need to start by tackling many white women's ongoing complicity in the broader conditions of subjugation, military and economic, which keeps their so-called sisters in the global south down. A South African activist once said, come to my space, respect the people in that space, do not come and project. If it takes my white privilege to amplify this message, at least it will have served one positive purpose in the broader struggle for human equality. Thank you very much.